hosted by Central Washington University. My name is Jenna Skinner and I will be moderating the session today. This session is with Patty Reagan and will last until 1230 PM. Before we start, I wanted to let you all know that this session will be recorded. So if you do not want to be recorded, please turn your camera off at this time. Additionally, to make this a fun learning experience for everyone involved, I'm going to request that we all follow a few session rules. Um, make sure to ask only one question out of respect for others in time and also keep the chat clear of traffic. Only use it to propose questions, which Patty will be answering after her presentation. Um, now that we are all on the same page, I will go ahead and introduce our speaker. Patty Reagan volunteered at Tangent Putin Borneo for four months in 1984 and 1985. She then went on to found the Center for Great Apes in 1990, which currently cares for 58 great apes. 27, are those, 27 of those are orangutans and 31 are chimpanzees. There are 12 more rescued chimpanzees that will be moving to the sanctuary this coming fall as soon as construction is completed for their expansion. Center for Great Apes is one of the four GFAS accredited chimpanzee sanctuaries in the United States, which is the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, and is the only accredited sanctuary for orangutans in the Americas. So, Patty, whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. All right. Thank you so much, Jenna and Ashton, and thank you all for inviting me to speak. Um, as I was just saying, I was there three years ago at the college during Crime and Awareness Week and talking about um, our sanctuary. So it's kind of fun to do this again. Um, I'm not tech savvy, so what I'm going to do is have you help me, Jenna, walk this through. I see the share button, and hang on a second. I'm looking for my PowerPoint. There it is. So you're gonna to have to tell me when you see it. Yes, we see the um, your slides right now. Okay, great. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, basically three things. Um, why great, where great apes are in captivity and why they are in the situations they're in, especially orangutans. And also talk to you, tell you a little bit about our facility. Some of you are very familiar with it, have even been here. Um, I know several of you are recognized names that follow us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, but um, I'm gonna introduce you to a few of our special arrivals. But I wanna start back with just kind of a review where great apes have been in captivity. And of course, in AZA accredited zoos, um, Unaccredited animal attractions might mean safari drive through parks, even refuges that say they rescue them, but they're not accredited, roadside zoos, and then breeders and dealers who primarily sell them to entertainment or for the exotic pet. Um, entertainment, and there's all kinds of, we've rescued animals that have been in circuses, and of course, movies and television, advertising is a type of entertainment and live stage shows. The exotic pet trade has been a big user of great apes in the past 50 years. And then research, not only biomedical, but cognitive and language um, and behavioral research is another area where they've been kept primarily for those purposes. And then sanctuaries. And sanctuaries are pretty new on the scene. Um, there was one in Texas that's been probably around 35 years. And we, this is our 28th year, so we're one of the, um, oldest sanctuaries, and I feel like we're still brand new, but it's rather new on the scene. So um, these animals, especially, we take a lot from entertainment. Um, we have the largest group of entertainment chimps, former entertainment chimps, and I think where my colleagues have, have more um, focus on research chimpanzees, but movies, um, nightclub acts, circuses, as I mentioned, uh, these are very, big um, tourist attraction in Orlando and Tampa that had stage shows, television shows, and the exotic pet trade. How did the orangutans, which are a critically endangered species, get into these situations? Well, the same way that chimps were, got, were in these situations, and even many years ago, some gorillas, but at basic exploitation, people identify with these human-like animals. Um, they love them. They 50 years ago, there were probably 200 pet chimps in this country. Um, so for orangutans, there are, as you know, three species of orangutans, Bornean and Sumatran, 
are the two that everybody has known about for so long. And then the Tapanuli are recently discovered, relatively recently discovered species. But any mix of these are called hybrids and they can still breed, but they are specific species. So in the early 1900s, when they were coming out of the wild to Europe and to the Americas, they don't always know where they came from, or they didn't always know. A lot of the babies were captured in Borneo or Sumatra, sent to um, dealers in Jakarta or Singapore, and then shipped on to captivity. And I just was looking at some records from Yerkes Primate Research Center in Atlanta. In August of 1963, they got something like 18 to 20 orangutan babies in from one year to five years, and some were pure born in and some were pure Sumatran, and they all went to the same facility. So, um, what they thought they could tell, of course, by their certain characteristics of each species, but they weren't always sure. And then in the 1970s, as karyotyping became a, a way to look at DNA, um, they could see if their population was pure Sumatra or a hybrid mix. So shortly after that, in the 80s at zoo conferences, um, the accredited zoo directors got together that had orangutans and said, well, we won't breed hybrids anymore because they're not a true species of orangutan. So we're not going to breed the hybrids. We're going to manage them to extinction. Well, Accredited zoos want babies because that's what brings in the public. And they also had species survival plans that um, were trying to keep the species alive in captivity. So if they couldn't breed their hybrids, many zoos, many accredited zoos outplaced them in the 70s to the early 1990s to breeders, to trainers in Hollywood and to unaccredited facilities to get them out of their population. Well, the breeders and trainers and and, and it, um, roadside zoos and so forth didn't care about the hybridization and they continued to breed for entertainment for pets and exhibit. And I just want to say this, a hybrid orangutan is an orangutan and they are functionally, behaviorally, every bit the same um, intelligence and beauty and, and as a pure Sumatran, pure Bornean, or I'm sure a pure Tapanuli. However, there are issues about hybridization down many generations. So it is smart not to breed them, um, but they are, we treat them just as every other orangutan here. So how did I get involved in this? Well, as um, it was mentioned, I did go to Borneo in, <laughs> over 30 years ago to volunteer um, for about four months with Dr. Galdinkas and we tracked wild orangutans and I also took care of a lot of baby orangutans. Well, after I came back to Miami, my degree is in education and I taught school for a number of years in, um, um, Miccosukee Indian Day School in the Everglades, which was a Native American project, and then ran a business, which was a temporary secretarial service, so nothing to do with apes or animals, but I volunteered at the new Miami Metro Zoo in the 80s when it opened, and I was on their board of directors for about six years, and a breeder in Miami that had a lot of these orangutans, like 18 of them, from um, zoos around the country and was breeding babies, knew I had worked with uh, Barute and had taken care of babies and showed up one day at my office with a four week old infant and asked me to take care of him for a few months. He said, you can get the license from Florida State Game and Fish. His mother won't take care of him. I have to travel. I thought maybe you would like to take care of him. Well, I have to say I was overjoyed. Of course, I'd love to take care of him. I knew nothing about the issues for great apes and entertainment or in the exotic pet trade or in research or really any type of captivity other than our own zoo and um, in Borneo. And even in the early 80s, when I was over there, um, we didn't know what palm oil was. It was all about logging that was the threat to wild orangutans. So I took this infant saying, oh yes, it would be fun. I assumed he was gonna go to an AZA accredited zoo in a very naive way. But when he was about seven months old, the owner, he had a, pair, a tourist attraction in Miami where he kept his babies as well as uh, many parrots. It was primarily a bird park and he had these babies on display there and I would pick him up at night, give him night care and then take him back to the tourist attraction. Well, when I went to pick him up, he said he had been sold to a circus trainer in New Jersey. So this was my aha moment that I realized, oh my gosh, you know, this is not the future I envisioned for this little guy. And I had no idea how I could be involved or stop that sale, but, you know, was pretty upset. And within a day or two after he told me that, he became very ill. And turned out um, he had 
seizures and high temp and the vet was treating for epilepsy, but we called in a pediatric neurologist from Miami Children's Hospital who let us bring him in for a cat and an MRI. He had spinal tap, uh, a series of tests over a few days and they discovered he had meningitis and he got meningitis from being a exhibit at the county fair in Miami that was going on that week or the week before when he was a photo op baby and there for the tourist attraction. So that horrible moment where he had over 200 grand mal seizures in two weeks and he looked like he was not going to survive turned out to be the very thing that led to the sanctuary. And if he hadn't got sick, he would have been sold. Um, so after he got well again, I went to the owner and said, please don't sell this baby now to the trainer. And he said, you know, you, you took care of him. You find a home for him. You can decide where he goes. Well, great. I thought I started calling zoos around the country that had uh, AZA accredited zoos that had orangutans. And that's when I got educated about the hybrid issues in captivity. Nobody wanted a hand raised baby and nobody wanted a hybrid. So as I continued to volunteer with him and look for a place, um, I thought, well, I'll find a good sanctuary for him. Well, as I mentioned in 1990, there were no sanctuaries for orangutans and there was one for chimps in Texas and that was it. And there were other orangutans. This is Christopher Ponga's little brother. Ponga was about five years, Christopher's about three, and other orangutans came through that bird park that were sold to Hollywood or as pets to New Jersey. And there were chimp babies. So I convinced the um, owner if he would let me, you know, I man the area with volunteers and let me keep them there and talk to the public about their behavior in the wild, he would let me find a place to put them and uh, outside of entertainment. So I established a nonprofit. And we found this property in 1997. It took me years to find appropriate uh, sanctuary land. It's in South Central Florida. I started with 15 acres of a wooded habitat. We have since purchased um, 30 acres over here, 35 acres over here, 20 here and more down the road to have a buffer. Well, what happened to that buffer was that the orange trees that we were leasing to a neighbor for income died from a project, um, a disease called citrus greening, which is hurting the citrus industry in Florida. So when they died, we went through. Oh, well, let's see. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I wanted to show you a bit about the sanctuary first. <coughs> Sorry. So this is where we started building our habitats. Everything was cages because we were in a heavily wooded area, so you couldn't have any open habitat. But it's, as it turned out, we built the geodesic domes, which were 30 feet tall. And here's Congo and Christopher when they were three and five. Uh, I'm sorry, seven and five when they moved up here. And then we started building larger habitats that are four stories tall. This one's 100 feet long, 42 feet tall. And as we kept accepting great apes, um, we continued to build habitats for both orangutans and chimps. And right now we have 19 outdoor habitats, some domes, some um, larger ones like this, and some very large. And we have uh, built a trailway system that's over a mile and a half now. I haven't really measured it since we've added to it, but it connects all our 19 outdoor habitats to each other so that the apes can get out, roam through the woods, go visit other groups or switch areas. So we rotate a lot, um, which is really great because they have, for instance, we have 11 different habitats for our orangutans right now. So they have 11 different places to walk to and visit that are the larger outdoor habitats. Very often, they just like to hang out in the chute, see who's walking by, get up high, they'll make nests up here, um, just travel around, see what's going on. And all the aerial trailways go to night houses where they have their bedrooms. And uh, this is Christopher, who is now 29 years old, our, one of our two original orangutans. And they have their choices every night to go into a night house or to um, sleep outside in their domes, or some even like to make their nests in the trailways. But in hurricanes, we lock them in, and in very cold weather, and lower than 40, we will lock them in, which isn't very often in Florida. And then the trailway systems connect to our um, health center. This is our surgery center and clinic where we do physicals, um, 
sometimes we have to stitch up chimps that they've had a particularly aggressive day um, and, and introductions, but that's not very often. And they walk to their, they can walk a physical um, or a vasectomy, whatever it is, and then walk home when they are ready. And we have a nutrition center where the diets are all prepared. Every tub here is one apes diet for the day. And in addition to their produce, they are everything is weighed based on whether they're um, orangutan or chimp, male or female, ages, weight, all of that. And the vet has worked that out with the zoo nutritionist, and then our, they follow the routine. And then they also get primate biscuits um, and just enrichment materials and foods, so forth. So what I'm starting to say, as we bought this property around, as these trees died, um, we were able to go in and pull them all out. This is the area that was the 35 acres and put a road right down the middle of what was the old orange grove and start to expand out here in the sunshine. And um, we did think about building open top enclosures, but really because of the lack of shade out here and you can't put anything over them, um, like trees inside or outside, we did decide to go with very large. This is a 10,000 square foot habitat, and this is what it looks like. And you can see up here, we put shade cloth on it, um, and we have trees now that have been planted all the way around it so that there is a lot more shade. These are this pictures a couple of years ago, and the different groups can rotate through these enclosures. So everybody might be a geodesic dome, or everybody might have the larger enclosures, and outside, we're building quite a few like that. I just wanted you to meet our oldest great ape of the sanctuary. Marco was born in 59, captured in 1960, and sold to a couple who were circus trainers and traveled um, a route in Oklahoma for 10 years with him in the circus. And then they retired and kept him in their garage in South Carolina for the next 35 years. He didn't come to us till he was 45, and I assumed he'd be with us maybe five years. Um, but he has been with us a long time and he's healthy and active and he only weighs about 80 pounds. He's a tiny little chimp and he lives with some other elder males and he's just doing great. But to introduce you to some of the orangutans and where they've come from, I mentioned the circus. This is Radcliffe and he was actually born at a zoo in Ohio who, because he was a hybrid, sold him to a circus trainer in New Jersey who had a couple chimps and he had um, another orangutan. He had two orangutans and three chimps in his act. So Radcliffe was castrated by the trainer so he could work him longer. And of course, the cheek pads and the long hair and the beards are all related to testosterone that orangutans develop, the males develop when they're anywhere between 15 and 18 usually. And um, Radcliffe never developed those because he uh, had did not have any testosterone, but he worked him for 12 years and then Radcliffe was too large and too dangerous. So he sent him to a roadside zoo in upstate New York. And after a year or two, they sent him to a really um, a, a small zoo in Kissimmee, Florida, where he lived. This is Radcliffe when I met him when he was about 24. And he lived in this 10 by 10 chain link cage with no shade and no climbing structures, no enrichment for 10 years. And this was his night area during storms, hurricanes, cold weather, this is where he went. And when the state closed down this facility, um, there was an, a chimp in the cage next to him. And we took Radcliffe in 2002 and the chimp. And when he got to us, he had no hair. He was um, emaciated, gray, not very healthy. And, and good um, sunlight and, and activity and space and nutrition. This is what Radcliffe looked like in 2003. Today, Radcliffe is, will be 44 in August, and he is our oldest male orangutan at the center. And you can see, as a castrated male, he looks like an adolescent. Um, he's a sweetheart, and we just watch his health every day. He has some kidney issues, and so we take <clears throat> urine samples every day. Um, he will allow us to draw blood for the vet to do uh, chemical analysis on his values and a lot of our half of our orangutans have been trained to partic participate in their health care with heart checks and um, blood pressure with a finger cuff blood draws and so forth this little boy was six years old when he made the movie dunson checks in sammy and then after the movie he was pretty much out of the ability to work him because he was 
getting bigger and stronger. And so for the next 10 years, he was in California at the trainer's compound and this cage. And we took him when he was 16 and brought him here with his females, uh, Jerry. And he lived here for five or six years, but we lost him during the night. Um, he died of cardiomyopathy. He had a great day, played with Jerry all day, had appeared to be so healthy, a good checks on health checks, but cardiomyopathy is one of the um, serious issues with all great apes and gorillas especially have been studied for 20 years. Now they're looking at chimpanzees and orangutans and we have several chimps with an issue where we have to monitor heart pretty much daily. And um, Sammy passed during the night in his sleep. Bam Bam was in the television show, um, a very popular show called Passions. He played the part of an orangutan nurse that was named Precious, a little female nurse when he was ages three, four, and five. And they were still running the show and he was still popular when that trainer decided to get out of the working great apes. And in 2004 and 2005, he sent us 16 chimps and six orangutans, 22 apes we took within a few months. and. Um, we were really grateful that he made that decision and that led the way for other trainers, I think, to start coming out of the business. And so this is Bam Bam today. He's 22. He's gorgeous. He has a girlfriend who is also in that group um, that came in 15, 16 years ago. And this is Tango. She was in the movies, um, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. She was on all the boxes of Tang in the grocery store for a while. And I have to say that's not her normal color, but um, she loves chalk and she draws on everything in her environment, her walls in her night house, her toys, the logs, her face a lot. And she will even draw on Bam Bam's cheek pads when he allows her and he's very accommodating. And um, they're a, a really loving couple. They're just, most of our orangutan peers are very sweet and protective of each other. So I hope Richard Zimmerman is on this line because here's Poppy. And um, the most famous trainer, I think, of orangutans was a man named Bobby Barracini. And I first saw him on the Ed Sullivan show many years ago with his orangutan group. He also had some chimps, but he did a lot of work in uh, movies. He, um, going ape, this is Poppy right here with what you know is not a natural orangutan smile. And she played the part of Poppy, the orangutan. And he was in Las Vegas. He was in the Clint Eastwood movies. Um, Poppy played Clyde's girlfriend in Any Which Way You Can when she was eight years old. So when he was in this Las Vegas act, she worked in Hollywood and Las Vegas for 30 years and um, almost 30 years, 25 to 30. And she was a group with a group of orangutans and a dancer in the show in Las Vegas filmed some backstage activity where she, um, the orangutans were being hit right before every show that went to court. Bobby Barracini left the country, got out of training orangutans, but sent his orangutans to another California trainer. And um, they eventually ended up, they were sold to by the trainer to the Great Ape Trust in Iowa. And then when they decided not to have orangutans anymore, most of those orangutans went to the Indianapolis Zoo and Zoo Atlanta and have good homes there. But Poppy and another younger female were still there and were considered special needs. And they came to us almost 10 years ago, I think 2012, so nine years ago this um, year and Poppy, it was special needs because she is pure born in and the second oldest orangutan in the United States. She will be 50 next month and she is healthy. She has good, good heart rate, good blood values. We check her all the time. She is a beautiful girl and um, we're going to have a big celebration for her 50th birthday. She is the second, as I said, the second oldest pure born in the United States. She's the fifth oldest orangutan in, in North America um, of S Sumatran hybrid in Bornean. And uh, somebody told me she's like the 22nd oldest in captivity, captive situations in the world. So be, this is her 49th birthday last year. She will definitely have a big celebration. Another orangutan that came from an exotic pet situation is um, Linus, I saw him, I took these pictures. I went to visit the woman when I heard she had a three-year-old orangutan and he came from the same breeding center that Pongo came from in Miami. So it was related and I wanted to see where he lived. At three, he was in the living room and climbing around the family, part of the family. But by the time he was five, 
He was in this cage in the family room where he lived till he was six and then he was moved down to the garage basement. And this is not him, this is Kiki, another orangutan that she owned. And um, he was not even next to her. There was a chimp between them and these very tiny cages. They never got outside, didn't see sunlight. She was in there 20 years. He was in there till he was 16. So we rescued them in 2006 when, and this is Linus when he got to us. This is kind of a well-known photo. You may have seen it. Um, he was so atrophied, he could barely stand. He couldn't walk. He was covered in feces and rotting garbage because he never could move out of that cage. He just sat in that cage. And um, it, we shaved him when we did a physical and he looked like a little plush animal, but it took a while. And this is him today. You can't see because my box is here, but Linus is now um, 30, 30 years old. He'll be 31 in September. And he's living with Jerry, who was Sammy's companion, and they're a great pair. And the other orangutan that you saw in the cage there was Kiki, who was in the garage, and we got her in uh, 2006 when she was 20. This is her in the quarantine night room. She was 270 pounds, a normal weight for an orangutan female in the wild is 90 to 110, and in captivity, probably 110 to 130. She was twice the size of a normal girl because she'd never had exercise. She was eating all kinds of junk food and Tootsie Pops and sweets. So it took us a long time. But Kiki today, 34, she's almost what we would call svelte. She's in good condition. She's about 140 pounds. And um, we took off of almost a whole orangutan in weight. And she is a beautiful girl. Louie came from the Hollywood attraction. He was the first one that we rescued from their first orangutan. He was performing till he was six. By the time he was seven, he had to stay in the backstage area. He did five lo live shows a day from ages about two to six. And then he spent a few years back here and we took him when he was nine. And this is Louie today. He's 25 and he lives with Allie, the female that came with Poppy. Um, and Allie's story is pretty amazing also. And Allie was born at the Yerkes Primate Research Center, just like Poppy. And she is 25 years younger than Poppy, but um, she and her mother were sent, Poppy was sold by Yerkes to the Hollywood trainer, Bobby Barasini. Allie and her mother were sent to the Denver Zoo. And when she was six, she came down with a, um, a very debilitating di nerve disorder that's chronic demyelinating polyneuropathy, where she actually was paralyzed on her arms and legs or could not move them for over a year as a six-year-old. And the caregivers and zookeepers at Denver and the staff worked with her for years, helping her with therapy and to regain the use of her arms. And she did. She was sent to grade eight trust because they could give her more individual care there. And then came with Poppy to us about nine years ago. She cannot use her legs at all, but she climbs all over up to her 30 foot cupola using her hands and arms. And she, um, we have special strategic fire hose and vines for her to help her get around. But even she'll go through the tunnels, the aerial trailways and travel around through those um, sliding on her back with, with fire hose that we put in for her. So we have several handicapped apes here. Um, of course, a lot of you know about our little cerebral palsy chimp Knuckles, who is not in this presentation, but he came when he was two with cerebral palsy and he is 21 now. And um, we've made lots of special adaptations for him as we did for Allie. And then our other one who's been with us the longest is Mari. Mari also was born at the Yerkes Primate Research Center um, to a very young mother who damaged her arms when she was only 12 weeks old. And they actually had to amputate um, they were so damaged that, that she couldn't use them. And so this little infant was put in the nursery where she, without arms and they cared for her there. And then she went to Georgia State University where she was part of the language research um, LRC, the Language Research Center's Cognition Language Project that Kanzi the bonobo was part of and Atlanta the chimp chimpanzee. And Mari was with a younger orangutan who soon went to a zoo, but that she ended up being the only one there. And the scientists there asked us to take her because we had two young males, Pongo and Christopher. So when Mari came in almost 20 years ago, 2001, um, she 
was immediately introduced to Christopher and Pongo, and today she is still a companion with Pongo, and they get along quite well. She climbs to the top of her dome using her feet and her um, chin. She carries things in her mouth and her hand. She gets along everywhere. She builds puzzles and loves to sort things. She paints with her feet. She's very capable. So just only four years ago, um, Louis' trainer that we had taken 15 years ago decided to get out of the work of business also of working great apes in Hollywood and in live stage shows. And he asked us to take his six orangutans and we did. Um, the oldest here is Sunshine and she was in her thirties and the youngest was Archie down here who was 12. Jethro, Bailey, Harry, and Keegan all were babies in Hollywood and performed in Orlando, or rather, and um, Los Angeles at this tourist attraction show. Many were also in movies, but these are some of the shots of them. This is Harry when he was five, and this is Harry today at age 21. He is a gorgeous male, our largest, almost 300 pounds and not a bit of fat, and he loves to be active, goes from habitat to habitat swinging. So um, he's quite spectacular. And Archie is spectacular in his own way. He's still a kid. Um, he is now 16. He's been here four years and he still does not have cheek pads. He and his older sister Keegan went right in with Sunshine in their habitat. This is Sunshine and Keegan. And just a word about Sunshine, I first met her 30 years ago when I was in Los Angeles and I asked to go to the backstage area to see the orangutans there. She had just finished a show. She was nine years old. She was having a juice break. And this was her area that she lived in when she wasn't in the show. Shortly after that, she was retired from the show. She ended up at the breeding center for a while in Miami where she actually had three babies. And this is her today, 30 years later at 39. Each one of these babies, her first one was about 23 years ago, um, were pulled from her right away and hand raised and were either at tourist attractions or one was sold. The last, the third one was sold to a trainer. And um, so she had never raised her baby. And we don't breed at the center. And a sanctuary ethic is really not, for many different reasons, not to reproduce more babies in captivity that need 50 years of care. Um, we try to give them as much enrichment as we can. We did have a baby chimp that was not born here, but came to us on his mother's belly from Hollywood a couple months. He been, uh, had been born a couple months before he was moved. And so those chimps, that family raised him, which was wonderful to see. But just the ethics of breeding in a sanctuary for any sanctuary, whether it's a farm animal sanctuary, big cat, horse sanctuary, if they're there for their lifelong care, you don't want to increase the cost and the um, just being in captivity and, and so forth. But Archie and uh, Sunshine had other plans and we had in 27 years, I've never had a birth control failure, but we had it one year ago. And shockingly, um, 30 minutes <laughs> after birth, we looked up and saw this baby. Um, we actually got there with mid minutes after birth. She was in the aerial trailways and just stopped in, in her walking out to the outside area and had a baby. And we were to say we were shocked is mild. And, you know, of course, it complicated our future and all kinds of our message. But after getting to know this baby and seeing her and the joy of knowing that Sunshine can raise her own baby. This is her fourth baby. It's been a true joy. And we named her Kahaya, which in Malay means light. And in Indonesian, radiance or glow, we thought that was very appropriate, not only for Sunshine's baby, but just in a very dark year with the pandemic. And she has been a blessed child for sure, as well as all our staff and also to her family. Um, <laughs> Keegan is giving her a little kiss and uh, Sunshine is allowing it, but very careful. She's a wonderful mother. She protects that baby, but does the baby interacts with all of them. Um, her father, Archie, is gentle with her. He plays with her. If he ever is what Sunshine considers too rough at all, she'll just reach over, pull the baby back, push him away, and everything goes on. So we're very grateful that it's worked out and that Sunshine has been such a good mother. She started cutting teeth a few months ago. And um, Sunshine has been the one 
as orangutan mothers do to introduce her to solid food. So she takes things out of Sunny's mouth or she picks up things that she wants it just not on that um, the adults leave around. So she still is nursing and she'll nurse her a few more years. She is getting some soft foods from the caregivers now and she is being trained. Uh, Sunshine is being trained to allow us to give her an injection and she's being trained for that because she needs her baby shot. So um, that's been a very happy moment. And another thing about her being a, a cutie um, and a beautiful smile is that it has engaged our members at a time they couldn't come here to really follow us and see what's going on with this baby and her development and we're grateful for that. Another arrival, very um, big news was Sandra. From, she was born in a zoo in the Rostock Zoo in Germany, and she actually went to another zoo, which is where Gina works now, and then sent to Buenos Aires. And she got legal non-human personhood status in a Buenos Aires court of law several years ago, and the judge decided in Argentina that they wanted her to not be on exhibit per se in a zoo, but wanted her to go to sanctuary care. Well. We're the only sanctuary, specifically accredited sanctuary for orangutans in North and South America. And um, there are sanctuaries in Europe that are farther away and even getting her back to you know, Sumatra was not possible because she is a hybrid and it is illegal now in Indonesia to bring hybrids into the country. So we were asked years ago to take her and we finally agreed, um, I have to say, that it took lots of uh, effort to get the sightings permit, the Fish and Wildlife permit, and we did it with the help of the Sedgwick County Zoo in Kansas, which is an AZA accredited zoo and one of the only three or four uh, CDC approved quarantine facilities for great apes. And she had to be quarantined for a month when she came into the country. And so these are some of the caregivers here at Sedgwick that she's getting on. This is not her. This look. I was shocked because I wonder if she got a glass. That's a poster of her on the crate that Argentina sent. She's boarding the plane in Buenos Aires and um, getting off the plane in Dallas where this crew picked her up, took her to Sedgwick where they quarantined her for us and gave her wonderful care. And then our veterinarian and the care staff drove up to Kansas and picked her up and she arrived here in November of 2019. And once she was here, this is her first moments coming out into the night house area, kind of exploring things, um, stepping outside into her habitat. She was very shy. Who are these people? Why aren't they speaking Spanish? Although we do have bilingual people here, but um, she was, and two of her caregivers followed her a few days afterwards from Buenos Aires Zoo and were wonderful in helping her adapt. But soon after she started exploring and feeling, feeling comfortable, she started climbing up into the habitat, um, cleaning everything in sight. Sandra is a huge water play girl. She loves to scrub her environment, scrub her hands. Many of you have seen the video went viral and actually it went viral in um, March, where some group was saying that she was washing her hands because of COVID. We filmed that in November, her first week here. So it had nothing to do with COVID. She just loves to wash things. So one of the reasons Sandra was chosen to come here is that we have a lot of orangutans and um, an opportunity for her to have a companion. She had lived with a male for a while in Buenos Aires. She actually had an infant that was pulled from her because she didn't raise it reintroduced when he was two or three and she treated him not as a mother but as a playmate and by the time she was only with him a few years he was sold to a zoo in china so for more than a decade sandra had lived alone in this little city zoo in buenos aires and we wanted her to have a companion and with our elevated trail system she could run through the woods and visit um, other habitats and they could other orangutans could come by her facility and the first time she saw Chucky, one of the big males, she started alarm barking in a gork with gorking at him, was very afraid, ran away. But each day as other orangutans hung out near her, she was more interested. Um, we tried to let her choose who she thought might be interested, but we also have some solid pairs here. We brought a few females by, but who she was most interested in was and Jethro was who we would have chosen anyway, because he's such a calm, and gentle male, he's been with females before. He lived with Bailey here for a while. Um, he is wonderful. And he is actually the older brother of Harry, who is not a calm male. He's kind of aggressive with the girls and he's a big 
rough and tough old teenager in his early 20s now, but um, Jethro is laid back. He doesn't approach her unless she wants to be approached. So we started a howdy between Sandra and Jethro. And I have to say, this is a, we started it in January. She'd been here a couple months. By March, they're still social distancing, which was perfectly appropriate for our pandemic. Um, orangutans are experts at social distancing. And for several months, they were in the same habitat, but just he'd walk over to her, she'd go up. He'd go up, she'd come down. He'd sit there, she'd walk by him, he'd go up. Um, so they kind of did this dance for a few months and then she started following him and she'd follow him out into the aerial trailways. She followed him into his night house. She was always interested in what he was eating. And eventually uh, she used to come into the same room. They have multiple rooms in their night house. She liked to sleep in the same room that he was nesting in. So it was wonderful. And by May, they had made contact and they are a couple today. They um, spend time together when they want to, and they spend time apart, which is like the perfect relationship. So that went very well. Then just six months ago, we were called again by a tourist attraction in Miami called Jungle Island, who had been closed for a year and they were changing their direction to become an adventure park, did not want to keep orangutans there. And we were thrilled to have the opportunity to give these guys a home because they all came from the breeders um, facility originally in, well, three of them originally, um, in Miami, where our others were born that went out to Hollywood and went to New Jersey, went to New York, and they're all related. These two at the top, Sinbad and Connie, are in their 40s. Sinbad came from a zoo in Chicago. He was traded when he was two years old for birds and went to the breeder. Um, Connie came from a zoo in Colorado. She was traded when she was a couple years old, very tiny. And they were bred. Connie happens to be our Christopher's mother and Tango's mother. So we were thrilled to have them come here so that we could, you know, eventually have met each other in the shoots. Tango and Connie have met each other. Um, very interested. And then Hannah and the twins, Pumpkin and Peanut, who were 16 when they arrived here, um, were all born at the Breeder Center and they're related to all of our animals here too, or many of them, not all of them. Um, we did have a sad moment. These twins, um, have been th together since they were babies. Peanut had cancer eight years ago, was in remission, but then was in renal failure. We knew she was terminal when we accepted her. She also had a critical bone issue. Um, there were all kinds of issues with her. We were in the discussions of how best to manage her pain and her value of life when she had a great week, played with her um, toys and, and her sisters, Hannah and Pumpkin were with her. She made a nest that night and she went to sleep and she did not wake up in the morning and she passed peacefully in her sleep just about a month ago. So um, we are grateful that she was here, that she had six months in the sanctuary care and was with her family. The other amazing relationship here is that Sunshine's first baby is Hannah. So Hannah is 23 now, and you can see the family resemblance of these ladies. They have seen each other. They haven't met each other up close because the baby is, Kahai is just too small um, to meet any new orangutans, but their habitats are only about 20 feet apart from each other. And Hannah spends a great deal of time looking at Sunshine and the baby, and Sunny watches Hannah and Pumpkin a lot too. So we're eager for that future um, visit when Kahai is a little bit bigger. And of course, Hannah is Kahaya's older sister, and they have in common that they are very um, friendly, happy little characters and beautiful teeth. So one other rescue I want to just mention that was um, three years ago was the Tiger King from Netflix. Um, Joe Exotic called me about three months before he went to jail and it told me that they were shutting down his zoo and he had two elderly chimps there, Joe and Bo that had been there for 10 years. They had females for many years with them, but they he had at one point seven chimps and they all died except for Joe and Bo. And both their female companions had died years earlier. So they were in these two separate cages at his place and did not have contact with each other. And we immediately went and picked them up, our vet and one of our caregivers and brought them to the sanctuary. And we introduced them in quarantine the first day and they were, hugging, grooming. It was very emotional moment. Um, 
these two old males and Bo is about he's close to 40 now. He may be 40 this year. Joe, we believe is wild caught, so we don't have an exact date on him. But he's close to 50. And the amazing thing is that Joe has four offspring here um, that made it here 10 to 15 years earlier than he did. And when he and his female companion, Lily, they used to be in shows at the St. Louis Zoo. And when St. Louis got out of their chimp shows, they sent him to a safari park in Oklahoma with Lily and they bred them there. And those babies were sold. Um, one was sold Murray to a pet owner in New York. And he arrived here, gosh, 11 years ago at age 18. And then he had um, two sons, twins, Jonah and Jacob, who were sold to a California trainer. They came here in 2004, and they're now in their mid 20s. And a, a female who's a couple years younger than Jonah and Jacob, Ellie, is here. So he already had four offspring here. And both these guys have a grandson here, um, which is very complicated. I'm not going to explain it, but Joe's offspring, Tonka, mated with. No, Bo's offspring, Tonka, made it with Joe's offspring, Tammy, at a breeder compound, and Bentley went into entertainment and ended up here, and he's now about 13. So they all have connections. It's just incredible all over the country, and with so many of them that come here are related to each other. So Joe and Bo met females. This is Joe with Maggie. They have been reunited with females in their life, and they're doing great. So just to kind of go over again where these orangutans are in captivity, these are current numbers today. I've checked with both the stud book keepers for the chimpanzee SSP and the orangutan SSP. Um, the numbers in the AZA accredited zoos are similar, and they've been pretty constant for the last four or five years. Um, unaccredited zoos, refuges, refuges and sanctuaries that are not accredited, and animal attractions. There are still 142 chimps there and 18 orangutans. And those 18 orangutans right now are in a zoo in Pennsylvania, a zoo in North Florida, and a zoo in um, Virginia that are family owned zoos, but not accredited with AZA. And then breeders and dealers, I have to tell you, when I started 30 years ago, there had to have been 15 to 20 dealers and breeders and, and great apes, especially chimps, but some of orangutans too. And now there's only two and one is going out of business. So there will only be one left. And um, we estimate 10 to 15 orang uh, chimps and no orangutans anymore. Private owners, there were at one point 20 years ago, over 200 in the exotic pet trade for chimpanzees. There were probably 15 orangutans. We're down now to 12 to 15 pets and one orangutan and entertainment. With three trainers, there are six chimps, I'm sorry, 11 chimps and two orangutans. And six of those chimps out of the 11 are with the trainer that has the two orangutans. Um, research was 1500 a decade ago or more, 15 years ago, maybe in biomedical research. Today, it's down to 289 and none for orangutans. And then accredited sanctuaries, Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, that is the newest scene on the, uh, the newest area on the scene right now, because as I said, they've started in response to taking these animals out of these situations. And why are they coming out of entertainment? And why are they coming out of um, church and the exotic pet trade? Because public consciousness is raising, and we know a lot more about great apes and their needs and their behavior and their lifelong. Um, Life, lifelong lives where they can't stay in someone's home forever and they can't stay and be worked on stage in front of actors and live audiences. They would get outplaced by the time they were six or seven. So the future care of these animals coming from pet and entertainment um, definitely has has caused the need for sanctuaries. And then just the, the cognitive research um, is one thing, but the biomedical research as the public has been more aware of that and not wanting to see that, many of those sanctuaries now are lab chimps that are coming out of research. So today, there's a, roughly 1,400 chimpanzees in North America in all these situations and 270 orangutans. And we, the 27 that are at accredited sanctuary are here. Um, just in closing, because I know I'm getting close on my time, I want to mention that we, you've heard about these if you've attended um, other sanctuary talks this week. 
the wildlife way station was a refuge in California that had hundreds of animals. It definitely was more than 40 years in Los Angeles. Um, big cats, a lot of bears, a lot of wolves, reptiles, birds, monkeys, all kinds of small animals, raccoons, kinkajous, native wildlife. And in 1996, um, the director took about 50 young chimpanzees from LEMSIP Biomedical Research Lab in New York. They shut down, they sent out, I don't know how many with the total number, but I know Fauna Foundation took some of, some of them, Primate Rescue Center took some. They went to several different sanctuaries and Wildlife Way Station took the largest number, around 50. They shut down a year and a half ago, closed, just closed their doors, Game and Fish took over in California. All of their animals have been outplaced to either sanctuaries or zoos or unaccredited facilities, but they've all found homes except for 32 chimpanzees that remain there. And why do they remain there? Because we're all we're all at capacity. We're all overburdened with the cost of caring for great apes. We spend about 23,000 a year on each ape here just for their care. That doesn't include the insurance, the phone, the office staff, the fundraising, any of that. It's just their direct care and their caregivers. So to bring in seven more animals is you know, a huge expense and not to mention 32. Every sanctuary is at capacity and only three um, AZA zoos, I'm sorry, two AZA zoos said they could take three chimps from this facility and they've already taken them. There were 42 to start with. Three have gone to Chimp Sanctuary Northwest and three have gone to primarily primates about a year ago. Three went to Indianapolis Zoo and Lincoln Park Zoo. One at Indianapolis, two at Lincoln Park. And one passed, one elder passed away at the Wildlife Way Station. So we're down to 32. There are four sanctuaries that have stepped up and said, we have the space to build if we can raise the money. And that's where we are right now. We agreed to take this group um, of seven chimpanzees. This is their cage where they have lived for since 1996. We are dubbing them the Sunshine Seven since they're coming to Florida. This is their nickname, um, Shasha. I, I don't know them all. This is Mystery. This is Maude, Sabina. There's four males, Billy, Ewok, and Josh. Um, Four males and three females, they're sitting there waiting for a home. And what complicates this so much is that they are in a canyon that's a high wildfire risk. And I, it's come through that facility before. They had to evacuate the chimps once before. Um, it's a huge issue. And so we want to get them out of there as soon as we can. And all four of us are trying to raise the funds to build. We have not hit our goal yet. Um, they cannot leave until we have a facility for them, but we raised some of the money. And so we have started in this area that I told you was the old Orange Grove area. This area right here is where we have started clearing. And uh, this is a temporary fence that we put up for the construction people so they don't wander into our new ape areas out here. And this is all the old Orange Grove facilities or area both new facilities and trees that we have to plant around it. So this will look different. Uh, we started on a night house, and this is where we are now. The roof planks will pit, be put on next Tuesday and Wednesday. The outside enclosures, we won't be finished with this till probably August or September. Um, so we're hoping to move them, and it's not good to move them in the summer across country anyway. Uh, very risky, but we're hoping by the early fall that we will have this completed with an indoor and outdoor area, but we don't have the money to complete it yet, so we're still working on that. And we want them to join our family. We are 31 chimps. These are our males, our 17 male chimps from the oldest of Marco down to little Bentley, who's the grandson of Bo and Joe, and he's 13. And our lovely 14 female orangutans, Oopsie, who came from Hollywood, and she two of her babies are here. And her grandson is um, Knuckles with cerebral palsy that was born in Hollywood. And down to our youngest, Chloe, who's about 15. And then our wonderful orangutans, Raddy, as I mentioned, is 44, our oldest male. And Chucky was the other orangutan in the circus um, with Chuck, with Radcliffe, that was bought by the trainer from another zoo. And they're both castrated males. He's in his mid 30s now. Down to little Archie, who's 16 and still doesn't have cheek pads, but we expect them any day. I want to say something else about Radcliffe because. Um, when he outplaced him at age 12 to the roadside zoo in New York, he was buying another orangutan, that trainer, 
for his act. And that was baby Pongo. And I didn't know the connection then, learned it at long years later. But Pongo would have replaced Radcliffe in the act if he had not gotten sick. So that's why I say good for fate. Um, and then our females, we have 15 beautiful females, Poppy at 50 and down to Kahaya, who's just turned one. And so our wonderful care staff, um, we have 18 caregivers, 31 staff, and there it's been a tough year for everybody. We've had no volunteers, we have 50 volunteers, but no volunteers have been allowed to come during COVID. So lots of extra work for the staff. And just to close this up, you never know what life will bring you when you volunteer for two months to take care of a baby. Um, he turns out to be the founder of your sanctuary. So this is Pongo and that is the end. And I will stop sharing and turn it back to you, Jenna. Awesome, thank you so much, Patty. That was amazing. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. So if you want to unmute yourself and ask Patty directly, you can do that. Or you could throw the question in the chat and I'll make sure to ask her for you. Um, it looks like Ashton has a question. What do you think? What do you think the future is for places like Myrtle Beach Safari? And how do you suggest people work towards getting rid of places like this? Um, well, it's difficult for me. I think that people are are not wanting to see great apes in dressed. And we know from research studies um, done by C. Ross and Jane Goodall and other scientists that seeing chimpanzees, for instance, in commercials and dressed in clothes and being held by people affect the wild chimps. People think that they're not endangered species. And so they're less likely to support projects in the wild. So as people, as that information gets out from zoo education and from articles and, and university groups like yours, people will tolerate these visions and these situations. I mean, I know that those that rang their hands there have swam with tigers, um, they've rid ridden jet skis and, you know, the chimps that he has are very smart and they're very interactive. And um, there is a market that some people like that, but I think it's it's constant education. I, I have to say, I don't know anything about Myrtle Beach. I know that um, he, I've never been there. I've never, I don't know the treasures, but they have a lot of money and they, um, probably can afford to take care of their apes for the future. Um, I don't have a lot to say about it. <laughs> awesome. Um, Anna would like to know, you mentioned that updates on Kahaya have kept people interested during the pandemic. What other ways have you found to maintain interest and involvement while you're closed? Um, that is a great question and we're trying to uh, do that every day because we're getting, I'm getting many emails every day. Are you going to be open for your annual? We have a member day event twice a year so that our members can actually come and see what they're supporting in March and December. So we had nothing last year. We canceled this March. We're not even sure about December yet, um, but people are constantly wanting to come. I have done some Zoom talks and Zoom visits like this with some of our donors. Um, mostly it's Instagram. It's sending out um, stories to our, our monthly e-news. Um, we've got a lot of local papers in Florida and so forth, and we've done some national news. Sandra brought a lot of attention to us, and I think we would have even had more interest in Sandra um, had we not had a pandemic and people suddenly could stop. I couldn't let a, a reporters come, for instance. And But we have sent a lot of pictures out about Sandra. I've done a number of media interviews online um, with TV shows and so forth about the apes and about Sandra, about bubbles. We have Michael Jackson's chimp bubbles here. And so with those animals that people really want to connect with, it's helped us bring it to the front. But we're all struggling with that. All the sanctuaries are really. If you have ideas, let me know. Send me <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? I do want to ask a question, Patty. Um, since you are, you're kind of unique because you were the founder and then you are still actively involved with your sanctuary. I was just curious, what kind of expectations um, did you have at the beginning? And how has it kind of grown beyond your wildest dreams? Oh yeah, definitely beyond my wildest. I started it for five young great apes, three chimps and two orangutans that I got out of the 
out of a situation of being sold as pets or entertainment. And we, so within the first year, we took an elderly female, and then the next year we took a tool to lab, former lab, wild caught surface chimps that had been in a lab. Um, and so I, I used to say, well, we, we have 15 acres, and then we bought 35 and grew and grew. We have 135 acres, I think now. And I thought, you know, really 10, 10 to 15 would be a good number. Never more than 20. We would never take more than 20. And then we got 22 at once from the trainer in California in 2004. So suddenly we were up to almost 40. Well, the board said, you know, I think 40 is a good number. I have turned down chips. I, it breaks my heart to say that. I've got at least six more besides the wildlife way station because each of us are taking a group of them. Um, we are taking some chimps also in the same facility from a breeder that is not going to be breeding anymore for chimps. And so that right now is 11 coming this fall. That will take us up to 70 great apes here. And there are still a couple in Puerto Rico, a couple more at the same zoo in Buenos Aires. They are begging us to take chimpanzees. There are others in the United States that need a home. We we have to limit it. I can't. It, it, you can't take more than you can afford, and and I, you're very close to that. But yeah, 20 was my top number, and I think 70 is now. We will be at 70. There will be attrition. You know, I I don't like to talk about it, but we have a 50 year old, a 62 year old, several these. We have um, animals that have some health challenges right now, and. So as the sanctuaries around the country, and especially the lab sanctuaries like Chimp Haven, Save the Chimps, they took a lot of older chimpanzees that were very um, at risk from years of testing and so forth. And they've already had attrition you know, for those chimps. As there is attrition, I think the sanctuary community will be able to welcome others that are coming out of these situations. And there really aren't breeders left much anymore. There's laws now that have been changed about selling primates across state lines. So there's not a market to buy primates, but there are there are situations that promote photo ops with baby chips. They're still on Facebook all the time. And and in third world countries it's a big thing. I have to say, you know, I, I was in Borneo. I held baby orangutans. I took baby chips and baby orangutans at this um tourist attraction, thought it was wonderful. It was fun. And I can understand why people want, every one of you want the experience probably of holding a baby. It is an amazing experience, but the rest of my life and all my money, <laughs> all, everything has been put into the future care of these babies who are now other people's babies. And I feel like um, you can't just keep breeding them and pulling them from females, especially when you know that the females do take care of their babies in the most part and make wonderful mothers. There are the unusual aberrant situations for sure, but um, you can't sustain that and then take care of these animals over 50 to 60 years. And sanctuaries, we have taken the burden of labs, of pet owners, of trainers, and I have to say there are people that do help us, some of the former trainers, um, some of the former pet owners have sent us donations periodically and help us with their care, but never the amount that it costs us. It costs us much more in a sanctuary to care for a great ape than it does in someone's backyard or in a home. And so let's just put that out right now. All of us spend between 18 to 30,000 a year per apes. So our figures are a little higher for orangutans than they are for chimps, but it averages out to 23,000 a year. So um, that's those are my wildest dreams, Jenna, and it's gone beyond and we're doing okay. I was going to retire a few years ago, but I just have to finish this project and then I have to finish that project and the next project. And so any of you want to come and run a sanctuary in the next few years, call me. <laughs> but you have a lot of background. So anyway. Thank you. Um, I know we are a few minutes over time. Do you have a time for another question? Sure. Okay. Um, Nirmal, I hope I pronounced that correctly, ask, how would you react if somebody asked you, we need to get rid of great apes in order for humanity to survive? Apart from entertainment, if we need to test on apes, the medicines needed to cure pandemics like COVID, would you support it? Do we have the ability to be empathetic and die? How far could we save them? 
Um, you know, I'm not an expert in the research techniques, but I have talked to experts and, and we don't have a lot of former research chimpanzees here. We have a few and we'll be getting more from wildlife waste station, but I have talked to experts who say there are many ways to model the results of, and testing, and it doesn't have to sacrifice great apes. And I have to go with that because I feel that they are sentient beings that um, are not responsible for our survival. Why do we have to test on them to make sure we survive? Um, you know, I'm sorry. I think that all animals, all beings have their place in life and they are here for a purpose and they fulfill their behavior and their niche. And I don't, I don't agree with, um, with sacrificing them to make us live longer. I just don't. So, there, sorry. <laughs> Nope, that was a good answer. Um, I don't have any other questions in the chat. So if you, if anyone has one that they're typing, I'll give you a few more seconds. Um, we do have our next session is pre recorded and it's going to start in 4 minutes at 1240. Um, so you guys can look forward to that. Um, but if you do have a last minute question to ask Patty, go ahead and type it now or unmute yourself. Okay, well, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Ashton. Um, was all of you, it was really wonderful. Great to see Debbie and Gina, Matias, Pat. In Pearson, I saw you. I didn't see Rich. Did he ever make it? So good to see you all. And thank you. So I'll go ahead and shall I leave? Yep. It looks like we don't have any other questions. So thank you for joining us, Patty. Okay, I just have to figure out how to leave.